So that's happening. Then I've talked a lot about these efforts to improve the accuracy of same-sex couples. So they have initiated a large-scale project in which they're assessing actual changes to the ACS household roster and, it, more interestingly, the marital status question. The household roster has been a fairly fluid set of responses, so adding and changing responses to that, I don't, I mean, it's not common, but it has happened. Changing the marital status question would be a really big deal on a, on a survey like the American Community Survey. And they're trying to figure out how to change that in a way to capture these non-marital forms of recognition. And it's difficult because, and the problem again is different sex couples. Um, they don't know what a domestic partnership is. is the, so if you get your benefits as a domestic partner thing, different sex couples seem to assume that means they're in a, a formal domestic partnership even though you know, that's not how we're meaning this term. So they're struggling with this, but they are actually doing testing and considering these things. So what has been our role in, in this effort? Well, first, um, this was uh, something that, that Lee brought to the Williams Institute when her organization, the Institute for Gay and Lesbian Strategic Studies, joined this team. Um, and she had a, a grant from the Ford Foundation that brought together scholars from around the country. They met for over five years and uh, came up with, and to, to ask, how do we get sexual orientation questions on surveys and uh, what are the best practices for the questions to ask and for analyzing those data. And so that produced a document that has just been indispensable in, in the efforts um, because the first question you get is, well, what question do we ask? And we can just hand them this and say, here's the opinion of a, 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 a prominent foundation's study of over five years, big set of scholars, lots of testing. Um, so it's been enormously valuable. Um, a second is kind of public pressure. Uh, as I said today, I have, or uh, tomorrow, uh, in the Washington, it's up on the website now in the Washington Post, an op-ed calling for LGBT data inclusion. A, uh, a few years back in the LA Times, an op-ed suggesting that they need to count these same-sex uh, spouses in the data. Um, and the truth is census pays attention to those things because census is very sensitive to people not being willing to answer their surveys and they don't want to tick off constituencies so um, they actually are sensitive to public pressure like this um, and because their concern is that if a group gets too hostile they're they're not going to be willing to participate in their surveys and and that's a meaningful concern for them and then finally the the kind of partnership that i think several have spoken to this year, uh, there was an unprecedented effort by the Census Bureau to um, promote the census with, specifically within the LGBT community and promote um, participation in the census by the LGBT community. And, when they did, and so they hired staff across the country to do explicit LGBT outreach. When they did that, they came to us to say, you know, what do we tell this community? Because, of course, it was a little bit of a tough sell. There's, they didn't have a sexual orientation question. They didn't have a gender identity question. It was this kind of quirky same-sex couple question. So we tried to f say, here's the ways you can try to encourage and talk about the, the same-sex uh, couple data as, as really valuable. And um, I believe we're the only organization in the country in which these kind of uh, outreach materials were co-branded with the census. So. Um, that, that, and that partnership has also then led to Director Gross being so willing to come and talk today to us or, and to um, just an ongoing kind of collaboration and a kind of heads up where we keep each other informed uh, about the work we're doing. So it's been uh, incredibly useful. Um, so new things that are happening, Jody alluded earlier to we're doing a transgender roundtable to begin a process kind of akin to that um, uh, best practices to think that thought a little bit about transgender stuff, but this is a very intentional process to think about measuring transgender um, identity and, and, and the transgender population. Um, a, a recent success is that de the Department of Labor accepted our, we submitted a, a short research brief on uh, questions that they should add to a survey that assesses people's use of the Family and Medical Leave Act, and we got them to add a sexual orientation. They 
unfortunately did not take our recommendation to add a gender identity question, but we did get a sexual orientation question and they added some response options that were kind of sensitive to LGBT issues. Um, they are supporting my work with Mike Steinberger in a, Steinberger in a variety of ways, th sorry Mike, um, in a variety of ways in which we're assessing the same sex couple data and uh, including access to confidential census data that allows us to assess that better. They're uh, providing the funds to, uh, so that we can get access to those data. And I'm also serving on the advisory group for this couple to this project to assess same sex couples. So the last little bit of my presentation now is just to kind of walk you through a little bit, okay, what do we know uh, from the data? So the first is my now uh, infamous estimate of the size of the LGBT community. Um, Nine million people, uh, the laundry list of what's freaking people out, um, 3.8, it's not 10%, what does that mean? Um, Gay, lesbian, 1.7%. Bisexual, 1.8%. Um, that's freaking some people out. Um, and the trans number is has some people a little uh, jittery. Um, but again, my idea was to look at as many population-based surveys as I could find in a fairly recent time window. Um, I borrowed from, for you political junkies, I borrowed from kind of real clear politics or Nate Silver, this kind of polling, poll of polls approach. Um, none of these surveys are perfect. They're all entirely credible methodologically, but they're not perfect. So perhaps one of the ways that you can kind of smooth out potential biases too low or even potentially too high is to smooth out the results with an averaging. So that was the, the attempt here. Um, so uh, bisexuals are more likely to be women. Um, in all, all but one survey, the majority of women um, among lesbian and bisexual women were bisexual. In all but two surveys, uh, the majority of men uh, self-identified as gay. So this is a really common pattern in, uh, in all of these surveys. Um, this is, I doubt, a surprise cohort effects. Younger people are more likely to self-identify and it goes down with age. So um, in the general social survey, which I always have to caveat, the results I show here from the general social survey are from a, a pretty small sample size. So I would uh, treat them as suggestive, not definitive. But you know, you see a very clear pattern. It does show up in a much more robust survey, the California Health Interview Survey. Not The pattern isn't as strong, but certainly for seniors, it is statistically significantly lower than what it is for the older or for the younger cohorts. Um, education is a persistent finding in surveys. LGB people tend to have higher levels of education. So this is the general social survey again, same caveats I just suggested. Uh, the, the California Health Interview Survey. You see that, um, so, so in the CHIS, 35% of heterosexuals have a college degree compared to almost half of lesbian and gay. Not that different. The, the uh, bisexuals and heterosexuals, there's not that big of an education difference. Uh, it's mostly driven by gay and lesbian. Uh, there's a lot of college educated bisexuals in the GSS, but a huge amount of less than high school as well. So it's kind of an odd distribution there. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a, there's a clear pattern of gay, lesbian identified being uh, higher educated. Um, racial and ethnic diversity, there's, there's a kind of um, a, a pattern in the literature that suggests that minorities are less likely to self-identify as LG or B. Um, I don't find that in a lot of these surveys. There's a difference in B versus LG by minorities. Minority, racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to use bisexual than whites are. But if you look at the, the general uh, racial ethnic distribution, if there were huge differences, then gay and lesbian should look different. And the percent white is about the same in both of these surveys. Um, there's some minor differences, you know, when you take the individual racial ethnic categories. But on the whole racial ethnic minorities, I don't think that that pattern is as strong as some people assert it to be, that that um, identity is so different. Um, I think there's some evidence that it is, but it, I don't, again, I just don't think it's as strong as some suggest. Um, 
This was, uh, we added questions uh, two years ago to the general social survey where we asked sexual minorities about coming out. And uh, we asked a battery of questions about coming out, about discrimination. Um, that's an upcoming report that we're going to do. Um, and also about um, family and relationship status. But what we find is, so one of the questions when I tell you that half of the LGB are B, the question I get is, like, where are all these bisexuals? You know, I don't know any of them. And, <laughs> and, and uh, let me assure you, you know, I know some of them. So I, it, it, it's, it's absolutely there. But also, one of the places they are is they're closeted. And this is the one of the most fascinating findings about, that I think about um, survey stuff. So I constantly get this thing that you can't measure because you have the closet and people won't answer the question. Except that 13%, if you sort of combine LG and B, 13% who used the word LG or B to describe themselves in the survey said they had never told another human being that they were LG or B. And yet they told the survey. So we should not assume that everybody who checks LGB on a survey is out to anybody. There are, in fact, people who will tell a survey and not tell another human being. Um, now, that's not to deny that there are also people who won't tell the survey, but it's to say that we should not assume that everybody who's closeted will, will never appear in our data. But the big difference is only 4% of, of lesbian and gay people said they had never told anybody compared to 25% of bisexuals. And in the workplace, it's almost, it's, I, sorry, I can't see, I think it's 6% of bisexuals are, are out um, to everybody in the workplace. And m almost half are out to no one in the workplace. So it's a much more closeted group. Um, what, what do we know about same-sex couples? Well, right now the estimate is 1.16 million individuals are part of a same-sex couple, so 581,000 same-sex couples. Of that group, and this was from our same-sex couple survey, about 70% are not married or in a civil union or DP. About 14% said they were legally married, and 15% said they were in a civil union or RDP. Interestingly, of the married group, um, more than half, or um, uh, sorry, 43% had formerly been in a civil union or RDP. So there's, it's kind of like a pathway to marriage for, for some couples. And then if you look at the group that's in a relationship, um, that in a marriage or civil union, um, I think it's about uh, 25 plus 16% are in a place where they're not recognized. So a, a big chunk of same-sex couples are in places where, th so they're, they're getting these statuses even though they're not recognized, which, which is also, I think, fascinating. Um, our estimate is that, so the census suggested that there was 152,000 couples who used the word spouse. Our current estimate is that about, there are about 80,000 legally married, that implies about 80,000 legally married couples and uh, we have some other data that suggests that there's about 85,000 couples who are in non-marital forms of relationship recognition right now. And again, 430,000 couples. So, so clearly, that 150,000 is a little problematic. It's not clear how to interpret that number, given the, the more, uh, those other statistics. So um, not all LGBT people are urban. Uh, this is uh, same-sex couples or in the case of the CHIS, uh, LG and B people, you do see that they are more urban than the population, but you know, 14% of male couples and 19% are fema uh, female couples are rural. In the California survey, 7% of LGB men are rural and 9% of women 